This is usually what a miscarriage is, the father's will. No one else will make this decision for her, only the father within her. 8. You must not commit adultery. The literal definition of adultery in your dictionary is, the voluntary sexual intercourse of a married person with someone not the spouse. Now, the reason for this law, which still applies now, was that well before and at the time that the commandments were presented by Moses to the people, they were mostly simple-minded, ignorant, illiterate and God-fearing because of their previous false teachings given by the religious-slash-empire leaders of their time. The problem was that, throughout your past history, many young men and soldiers would lustfully spread their fertile seed in the sexual act to many various young, willing women whom they met within their daily lives and in their travels from village to village. Times have not changed much, have they? The obvious result was that many women became pregnant, and usually by that time the man was long gone, to war or to the next village. So she would be left alone with the responsibility of birthing and raising her child. Many women could not handle this unexpected responsibility and the desertion of who they usually thought to be their man. Many women, overcome by the horror, shame and guilt of the circumstance, killed themselves and their unborn by trying to abort the child. Many women were left on the streets, unless they had friends or family who would take care of them. And many women abandoned their birthed child, sometimes at the doorstep of a church or orphanage, but also some would leave the child to die in some dark and desolate place. So thus the necessity of this law, you must not commit adultery. See law number 15, you must obey the wisdom of God for the responsibility you have of balanced procreation of your species. So in his loving mercy and infinite wisdom, God created the commitment of marriage or wedlock defined in your dictionary, as, a legal contract by a man and woman to live together, as husband and wife. In the higher realms it is a very serious and joyful commitment and is called divine union. In this way he planted the seed of joint responsibility of this husband and wife to each other and to any offspring they produced. This is, why marriage is to be considered one of the most serious and sacred commitments to God. Now we will quote some of the actual teachings given on this subject of the Father's word given by the Master Teacher Jesus, Esu, Emmanuel from the book, now in print, as part of the Phoenix Journal series, entitled And They Called His Name Emmanuel, I Am Sananda. Nearly 2,000 years ago when the Master Jesus, Isu, Emmanuel was asked about the commitment of marriage and the rights of men and women. This is what he said. All good things were given unto you and you receive the laws according to which you are to live. You should adhere to these and additional laws, so that you shall prosper on earth and have peace in your families. Remove the power of the old law that women shall be subject to man, since she is a person equal to man is spirit of respect, and has equal rights and obligations. There are many distortions in the laws, since they were given forth by God and the celestial sons, for men have built them to be suitable unto themselves. When a man marries a woman, he shall pay to the most trusted steward the handling of her possessions, as a price of security, lest she suffer from lack of her necessities. The price should be calculated in such a way that for each year of her life 100 pieces of silver should be the basis, measured according to her knowledge, her ability, and her strength, provided her health is not lacking. The price is not to be considered as that of a purchase, for no person may be sold or bought, but as security for the woman, lest she suffer lack. Amount and type of financial security for modern times will be adjusted accordingly. For further clarification of Emmanuel's statements read Phoenix Journal Express Volume 1 and 2, pages 34 to 40. The bond of matrimony between man and woman should be permitted only, if both are of mental competence and capable of leading a marriage in accordance with the law. Note that is God's law. The inability of a wife to bear children, or a man's inability to sire children is no reason for divorce, nor does she or he deserve other opinions or actions. The only reason for divorce is that of adultery, that is the destruction or endangering of spirit, the body, or the life of the members of one's own family unit. If a person is divorced by his own actions of adultery, he should be sterilized, for he is unworthy of life and its laws, for he has responded to the selfish lustful drives of pleasure seeking and has cast aside all responsible behavior. End of quoting. Now, in the literal translation in order for adultery to occur, then one or the other or both of the two adulterers would have to have made the vow of marriage. 
In God's kingdom of truth, this vow of divine union made between two, a man and a woman to live together as one, is taken most seriously indeed, because it is a commitment made to the Father within, each to the other for that entire life stream. It is a contract with God rather than a legal contract of the human experience. This means, that a man and woman who cohabit together, as lovers without a so-called legal contract must make the same commitment to God, as those who have the so-called legal contract, whether they realize it or not. It is not necessarily always a contract made to God to procreate the species, because many who choose divine union may not choose, be able, or be qualified to fulfill that, procreation, service to the One Father. Reared Commandment Number 6, where we discussed the responsibility of procreation. But both lovers still have the same responsibility, as a legally married couple, for the offspring they may produce. If they only choose cohabitation because of sexual lust or other selfish reasons, they have, thus, denied their responsibility to God, and they will suffer the consequences of their actions at the hands of evil. See Law Number 13, As you sow, so shall you reap also known, as, the law of cause and effect. Does this mean, that divorce, defined, as, 1. Dissolution of a marriage bond by legal process or accepted custom. 2. Any radical or complete separation, goes against the laws of God and the creation? Yes and no. You see it depends on the true circumstances experienced by the divorcing couple. For example, since your commitment in life is always first in service to God, then ideally, your chosen partner in marriage must support your commitment as well as his slash her commitment to the Holy Father. If, for example, your partner batters you and or your children physically or emotionally and thus does not support or honor either his or your commitment in service to God, then you are no longer bound by your contract of marriage. Why would God bind you and your children to a commitment of suffering and punishment? It is not logical. But, if your partner decides that he slash she wants to divorce you, because you are just no longer attractive to him slash her physically and sexually, this is not an acceptable reason for divorce. Let's take that example further. Say your partner is no longer attracted to you and decides to find sexual satisfaction elsewhere, he slash she has committed adultery, reared above quote by Jesus Emmanuel, and if you choose to do so, it is an acceptable reason for divorce. The reason is that not only has your partner broken his slash her commitment with you and himself, but in the act of adultery he has broken his commitment to serve God, because by the act of fulfilling his lust he has invited the Antichrist within his temple. Of course, the choice you make about whether or not to divorce an adulterous mate will ultimately be made by the father within you. 9. You must not steal, materially or emotionally. This law does mean literally that you must not steal defined as 1. To take another's property, etc., dishonestly, especially in a secret manner. 2. To take slyly, as a look. 3. To gain insidiously or artfully, as he stole her heart. And this law also means, you must not steal the trust and good faith of another by lying to them about your true motives and intent. You see, malicious lying and stealing are opposite sides of the same coin. Here are some examples of various forms of lying and stealing. If a man falsely tells a woman who is a virgin that he loves her and wants to marry her, but all he really wants from her is a sexual encounter, he is misleading her. If she in good faith falls in love with him and also falls for the trap of his false promise to her and succumbs to his pressure to express their love physically before the marriage vow is made, and then he abandons her, he has essentially stolen her heart, her innocence and her chastity for his own lustful, selfish intent. Even if the woman wisely refuses his sexual advances, and finds herself rejected by him, he is still guilty of lying to her which is stealing from her emotionally. The big difference in these two scenarios is that, although she has been robbed emotionally, at least she doesn't have the guilt of dishonoring herself by breaking the laws of God and giving away her chastity to an unworthy man. Here is another example of stealing the innocence of another. Innocence defined, as, 1. Free from sin, evil, not guilty of a specific crime. 2. Harmless 3. Knowing no evil for, without guile or cunning 5. An innocent person, as a child. Now stealing in itself is a sin against God's laws upon only the one who steals, but when one succeeds in stealing the innocence of another, what he has essentially done is willfully and blatantly lied to them, so thus he has enticed and manipulated the other to also break the laws of God and the creation.